Now, this is something that um, when you're when you're doing mobile surveillance, the question, the number one question I usually get on mobile surveillance is, you know, how how close do you get? How far away do you get? It's really, really a difficult question to answer just because the conditions and the dynamics of traffic change. The, what, are you in a city? Or are you in the rural environment? So we're going to look over some of those, those issues right now. The best way I can, the best way to describe or to tell you or instruct you to, on how close to get on a subject is, is determine as soon as you can their vigilance, like their level of awareness, and are they looking around or are they pretty clueless? And I usually stay pretty tight on a person, if, it, if, if they come out and they're looking around, then I'm gonna stay back. But if they come out and they're not looking around, they get in their vehicle and they go to leave, I'll, I'll generally stay pretty tight on a person. And I'm not talking on their bumper. Like we're not put, hook, hooking up a, you know, a trailer to a, a ball hitch there and you're not gonna be on their bumper that close. Uh, you usually have a, a one or two cover cars that we're gonna talk about. but look at their demeanor, their behavior, how vigilant they are. And then you, what you're trying to do is learn their patterns and their, be, their driving behaviors. Do they speed? Do they cut corners of intersections? And, and then again, like the traffic is gonna influence the distance. So what you wanna do also is depending on how many are in your team, you're gonna alternate positions while you're following. And so, I'm going to show you a lot of examples as as we move through here, but this is just some of the things that you want to consider, um, depending on the traffic um, and how how tight it is. Is alternating position. So there's two of you. Just make sure you're not the one with the subject all the time. That if you're with them for a while, and you know if they seem totally oblivious, and they're just driving, and you're in a good spot, and you're then stay with them for a while. Again, there's no there's no total science to this. It's just kind of reading your your subject. Now, on disguising your vehicle, um, and this is kind of like camouflaging, disguising your vehicle, and I do this quite a bit just because if you are on a smaller team and you're with them more, you just kind of want to change what you look like to your subject if they happen to be looking in their rear view mirror or their side mirror. Just give them a change. And some people... It's real. We'll talk about how you get paranoid and stuff, but a lot of investigators will think, "Well, if I if I change up my car appearance, then they're gonna they're gonna be suspected or, or suspicious. Like, oh, why is this vehicle that's following me all of a sudden now their sun visor is down? Now there's a box of Kleenexes on the dashboard. Now the driving lights are on. The driving lights are off. The headlights are on. Headlights are off. They're not gonna think that way. All you're doing is just changing it up so that. If they, if they, so that in their, their subconscious or their peripheral vision, they're just not seeing the same looking vehicle with them all the time when they're looking in the back. So, so hang items from the mirror, hang them, take them off, place items on and off the dash, modify your lights. And um, I'll do that a lot of times with, even with driving lights that I can disable, I'll have them on for a while, then I'll turn them off. Then I'll have driving lights, like the fog lights I'll turn on, then I'll turn off. And, um, and and what's really nice with, um, if you are using a rental vehicle and you think that you took a little bit of heat, just go change it out. I Many times, um, especially when I'm working more solo or on a team of like two or three, if I'm with some, a sus suspect or a subject really heavy for a day, and maybe they, they did pay attention to my car a little bit, or I just felt like, yeah, you know what, I need to go trade out. And I'll just go to the airport generally or find a facility and trade out my vehicle. And now you got a brand new rental vehicle to uh, to utilize for the next day. All right, so let's look at um, modifying your driving techniques. And this is, this is something that investigators, when they get tunnel vision, they don't think about changing up their, their driving or modifying how they're driving. They're just tunnel vision on not losing the subject. And they, what they do is they, they don't realize it, but they start mirroring the subject and start doing what the subject's doing just because they're focused and they're not paying attention. And so what you want to do is use lanes intermittently and really um, like you don't have to be in the lane directly behind your subject, especially on a freeway or on a road where 
maybe the curb lane is a better lane to be in um, if they're in the middle lane. And um, you really got to use the environment and just try to see what's coming up and try to anticipate. For example, on a freeway, if your subject's in the middle lane then, and you're far enough back, I have no problem staying in the middle lane. It depends, again, how much, how many teammates you have on your, on your squad or your team. If you have three or four, then you can kind of can cover the fast lane or the number one lane. Somebody can cover the middle lane. Somebody can cover the outside lane or the curb lane. Um, if your subject's in the fast lane or the, like the HOV lane or the restricted lane, then you got to make a decision. If there's two subjects in there and they hit the restricted lane and, you know, there's a, there's a penalty if you use it and you get caught, it's a decision you're going to have to make um, because a lot of times they'll hit that lane and they're gone if you're solo in the vehicle. And um, when I was in law enforcement, obviously, I would use that lane just because I was in law enforcement. I didn't have a problem if I got pulled over where they would give me a ticket or anything because um, they knew I was doing a surveillance. When I'm doing a private surveillance, uh, I go into that lane assuming that if I do get stopped, that I will get a ticket. And so it's kind of a decision you got to weigh. And you know, maybe you can get out of it, maybe you can't get out of it. But there's more than one or two investigators have somebody always covering that that curve lane, especially on a freeway, just because your exits off a of freeway are typically going to be on the right. And a lot of times your bad guy will be cruising along in the fast lane. And then like I've seen it hundreds of times, right? All of a sudden they like, whoosh, and they start cutting over lanes really fast to get off on a freeway. The last thing you want to do is be in that fast lane with them when they start cutting over to get off at the last minute on an exit. And now you're trying to come over to get off that exit too. If you, if they do do that and you have something in the curve lane, then you just go ahead and let them, let them cut over and, and maybe you got to take the next exit, which are, they're typically about a mile apart in most cities. Um, although in Atlanta, a few weeks ago, we missed one exit, um, you know, cause I didn't go with the subject and it was a good, I want to say like six or seven miles. It was, it was definitely more out in the rural area of Atlanta. And um, so um, I was kind of out of it for a little bit, but it's better than, than exposing yourself and potentially taking a burn by cutting across traffic. So I, I, I talked about, and so just use lanes intermittently and then also don't change lanes with the subject. And that's the kind of that mirroring thing and, or don't do it consciously. Even there's no reason to do that. When you are close, use the blind spot. And here's the blind spot that you can see in the mirrors. Uh, and I, I use blind spots a lot. What you got to be careful is that a blind spot is a blind spot. And so if your driver, your subject you're following isn't paying attention, they, you don't want them to come over and hit you. So be aware that they could slide over just because they don't see you. They're not paying attention. But it's a good place to hide. The other thing I want to mention here is um, when a subject comes up to an intersection like a, a traffic light and you are in that lane that isn't directly behind them. When you're in that other lane and they come up to a stop light or a stop sign, just pull up next to them. Like, don't be afraid and stop back at their at their their trunk. And I, I see it a lot, and I usually see it in the surveillance training that you just don't want to. Investigators don't want to pull next to a subject, even if it's a role plane, because they feel like they're going to be exposed. And you're actually drawing more attention by stopping at the, the back of the car than you are just pulling up next to them. Now, if you wanna pull up and you're pretty pretty far up, but you're not you know, necessarily front window to front window, that's fine. Just make it look natural. It's all about not drawing attention by doing something that doesn't appear to be unnatural. Now, the burn zones are when you're when you're set up at a, at a stationary location on surveillance and then like a residence, for example, and your subject leaves a residence, a hotel, apartment, a drug house, wherever it might be, anytime somebody is leaving a location or arriving at a location that is maybe questionable or criminal activity going on, they're gonna be more aware, especially at their residence. If they're at their home, and they're leaving, they're just going to be more aware if they're involved in criminal activity or they're trying to hide some type of injury they have, right? They're going to, they, they know that that's the most likely place for an investigator to do, to do surveillance is at their residence. So 
they will be more aware. Now, as they get further and further away from the residents, they start getting more comfortable and then they get more complacent. And then just like with injuries, right? Let's say you're working an insurance case and the guy will come out of the house with a cane, with a neck brace on and, you know, be putting on a show and then get in the vehicle all stiff and everything and doing everything like an injured person would. But then they go to the mall and the next thing you know, they're getting out of the car with no neck brace, no cane. And they're walking into the mall. Why? Because they don't think that they're being followed. And so realize that they might be looking though too. And, and a lot of attorneys will tell their clients like, um, just to let you know, um, you know, the, there may be surveillance put on you just to make sure your injuries are consistent with what you're claiming. And so a lot of times they're warned. So let's talk about surveillance staging locations. This is when you're going to go out there on a, on a, on a surveillance and you're going to meet up with a group and you have other investigators and, and it's real common in law enforcement. We called it 1025 and like, Okay, 25 me over here. It's radio code, which means meet. And a lot of investigators or law enforcement that will do surveillance will have a tendency because they, they were trained in patrol a lot of times and cop cars will park, you know, window to window and you just chat, do whatever. And uh, it's a, it's a real strong, um, it's a real strong draw to, like do that when you're doing investigations and you're in an undercover vehicle, just because you don't think that the bad guy is going to pick up on that. And I've been out driving around obviously for many years. And even when I'm not on duty and I'll see a couple of vehicles meeting up like that. And most of the time you ever see that it usually it's law enforcement doing it. They're, they're cops doing it just because that's what they do in patrol cars to communicate and talk to each other without getting out of their cars, right? They're ready to roll to the next crime. So if, uh, if you're going to meet up, stay off of the route of where your subject lives or where associates might travel by and stay out of the sub the site of the subject's house. And I'm going to give you a, a little story here on this because, um, it frustrated me and you know, I try not to get frustrated about things. I was working a, a subject out of Maryland and this, the subject was, was traveling the entire country doing fraud. So I went to Maryland located where he lived and set up surveillance. You know, his truck was there and everything. And so I met with, uh, I shouldn't have told you what state it was cause now you're going to know the, the police department. Right. But Let's just say I met up with some law enforcement that were interested in, um, in helping out, which is what I'm trying to do is get law enforcement to help me on some cases, right? And so the truck was there. I was meeting with the detective, and uh, this detective, while I was putting explaining the case and explaining all the evidence, um, I got a, a report that the subject, that my suspect was actually out committing fraud. And so this detective had a team, right? He worked on a squad and he, and he got a hold of his teammates and he said, Hey, um, this guy's out committing crime. If, if he shows up at his residence, let's get him arrested. And here's where he lives. And so they sent undercover detectives out to the house of the suspect to watch. They were supposed to watch for the suspect to come back. So then they could arrest him because we had evidence now. I mean, um, he was out committing fraud. We had fresh evidence and we're like, let's just get this done now. And so um, the detective also, we were like an hour from the subject's house. And so we got in our separate vehicles. He got in his uh, undercover vehicle. I got in my rental vehicle and we had to drive like an hour. This is, you know, this guy lived out kind of in the rural, rural area. And we drove out there and I got out there first and as we're getting out there, the detective's asking his team, like, hey, is the subject home? Subject home? No. There's only two entrances into this neighborhood. It's on a circle. And so, well, I should say it's like a U. And so, there's only two ways in and out. Like, it's real easy to cover. You have, you have two points that you can cover. 
So I got there. I went in the back way and drove around and I could see this, the suspect vehicle parked in the backyard. Now I've never seen the vehicles parked in the backyard. I had been out there a couple of days. He always parked in the driveway. So the fact he parked in the backyard was a clue that, that either he did some fraud and maybe like I hadn't been out on him when he's done fraud and then what his actions are, or his behaviors after the fraud, but now he's parked in the backyard. And so as I come by the house, there's, there's a, a bank next door to the subject's house. And in the parking lot of the bank, the bank is closed. Like this is like six, seven in the evening now. And in the middle of the bank parking lot are two units, like a, a truck and a car. And they're, they're 25 and right. They're basically window driver, window to driver window. And it, right in the middle of the parking lot. And right next to the suspect's house and you can see the the kitchen window it was actually it wasn't even a house as a trailer but you could see the window and everything so i i told the detective i said hey the the suspect vehicle is parked in the backyard and i go can you meet me at you know up the street and so we met i said this is ridiculous i said your your units are sitting right in in view of the sus suspect's house in a bank parking lot in the middle of the parking lot 25 in, and he, he could see that they were there if he looked out the window and I'm assuming he probably knew they were there so the detective was all mad about it and he basically said hey you guys need to like like you need to break up like there's two units there's two entrances into the neighborhood why weren't they not covering each entrance into the neighborhood because they would have had his truck coming in because they said, oh, no, he ain't, he's not here. Now, I'm not dissing other investigators, but that, that's like a very fundamental, like uh, apparently they do surveillance. <clears throat> and this is a very fundamental, fundamental aspect of a stationary surveillance is to cover entrances and exits out of a neighborhood. So it would make sense that they would cover it. What it came down to is that they weren't, they didn't really take the case seriously. They weren't really engaged. They weren't really serious. They were just told to go out there. They didn't want to be out there because they got off at, we're supposed to get off at like four or five o'clock. And so they were kind of covering until the detective got out there and they just weren't, they weren't really interested in it. And I'm, again, don't get me wrong. I, I don't, there's a lot of law enforcement watching this. I work with law enforcement. I was in law enforcement. I'm just taking or telling you that, that you have to take this, this serious. Like this is, this is surveillance. It's covert surveillance. It's not overt surveillance. You don't park next to your suspect's house or park out in front of the, the street in view. I mean, there's, there's a reason that you do covert surveillance to get intelligence and evidence. And in this situation, we would have had an arrest if they would have seen the truck drive in because they could have confronted him, contacted him when he got out of the truck, but they missed the truck and he's in his house. The truck's parked in the backyard. They don't even know if he's in the house. It, it pretty much fell apart at that point. And so, um, and that's, uh, that's why I'm stressing this point right here. Stay out of sight of your suspect and then stay off the possible subject or associate routes in, right? Uh, if it's a drug house and you got customers coming and going to a drug house and they're walking in, biking in, driving in, they see surveillance vehicles or they look at and see somebody sitting in a vehicle, especially like with heroin dealers. I, I watch people buy heroin all the time, right? And they're bouncing, they get bounced from gas station to gas station to gas station to family dollar to Dollar Tree to hotel, whatever. They get bounced around because they're the dealer keeps telling them to move because he's trying to coordinate selling drugs. And so when I'm watching my subjects waiting to buy drugs from a drug dealer, I'm also watching the area because I don't know sometimes where they're going to come in from. And if I'm a drug dealer, I'm going to look to make sure there's not a surveillance set, set up on my, on my customer. So you just got to consider these things as, um, as you're doing your job and looking at what routes and you got to take it seriously. This is a serious uh, role that you're doing here. Okay. So let's talk about transitioning from stationary to a moving surveillance. So on a team surveillance, like we did in the last example of a where you're set up stationary and then you did takeaways. If you have a team and I would say a team would comprise of, probably three or more would be a team in my mind. Otherwise it's just a, like a partnership, you and one, one other investigator. If you have a team surveillance, the eye is going to be out there doing the observation and then you'll have 
one or two takeaway vehicles. Let's say you have two takeaway vehicles. Now the eye is reporting activity periodically. And this is for safety reasons, and it's also so that the, the perimeter has an idea what's going on. If you have an eye on a location, nobody else can see what you see. And uh, most of us are visual learners or, or you know, we, we, we learn things or see things visually. And so what you want to do is paint pictures. So you're on the eye and you're reporting that activity periodically. And, you know, it could be a half hour, an hour. Um, it, it depends. Your organization might have some type of policy where uh, at, on every hour you need to report something or every half hour, whatever it might be. And, and like I mentioned, it's safety wise, if you don't hear a report of some activity, even if there's nothing going on, a lot of times you're there for four or five hours, there's nothing going on, there's nothing to report, but um, you could be a victim in that neighborhood and something could have happened to you or you could have passed out or you could have fell asleep. And so you want to report periodically so the team knows you're, you're fine. And then also the team is sitting out there a lot of times doing nothing. So what do you report? I report everything because let's say you show up on a surveillance scene and the, and the, you know, it's trash day and the trash truck, the trash um, truck has gone by um, or there's trash cans out in the street. Now, if your subjects uh, residence has trash cans out like the neighborhood does, that's a clue, right? It's a clue that somebody must be in the house, not necessarily in the house, but somebody put the cans out. And so if they put the cans out, if there's somebody in the house, they may, when the garbage man comes, they may take the cans and put them back in the house. So that would be something you'd watch for. So I'll report trash cans are out front. Uh, neighbors, you know, are pulling their cans in, which means what? Well, they're probably empty. The trash man came by. So we'll watch and see if anybody comes from the house. The other thing I, I'll look at a lot of times is the lights. Like are the lights on the garage and like the outside lights, are they left on during the day? If they are, a lot of times your subject has gone and the lights were turned on at night, they're gone and there's nobody home. And there, a lot of this you'll get in, in kind of reading the environment and it all comes out down to like, like looking at activity and behaviors and things that you can kind of read into and try to make some logical decisions. Mailman. If the mailman comes through the neighborhood and drops off mail, I'll report that, hey, mailman's coming through. Why? Because if a mailman drops off mail, maybe my subject or suspects are gonna come out and get their mail, and so now I have a, there's an opportunity. Um, just recently on a surveillance, um, I didn't see the package get dropped off, but because um, I didn't have a direct eye in the house. But I did a drive-by on one of my, because I couldn't get a direct eye, so I was covering the exit out of the neighborhood. I was in a really good spot, it worked really well but I didn't have a direct eye and I didn't care about a direct eye. I was just looking for the car, but I'd periodically do drive-bys to make sure my car didn't show up. Cause uh, like, even if you're watching a house and, and your subject vehicle is there and you're watching for it to leave every like hour or so, like do a drive-by just to make sure you didn't miss it. Cause sometimes, I mean, we're human, right? We could uh, get a phone call and you're looking at your phone to see who's calling and in that like one or two or three seconds, your car drove by and you missed it. And now you're sitting there for five more hours, not knowing the car is gone. So I had looked, I'd done a drive by and all of a sudden I noticed there's a package leaning up against the door that hadn't been there on my previous drive by. So now I know the lights are on at the house and we're talking, this is probably about 11, 12 o'clock. And there's a package leaning up against the door, the front door. So if that door opens, the package is going to fall. Or if the package goes missing, I know somebody retrieved that package. So now that I had that, I would do drive-bys every so often, and the package never moved. And then one of the investigators actually located the car um, a short distance away at a convenience store. And so um, thank goodness that investigator was being aware because even though they were on a perimeter position, they weren't just sitting there screwing around. They actually observed the car. And I think I mentioned that one, the one with the skulls. Uh, we were looking for that car with the skulls on the back and he actually observed it um, at another, at a, at a business or so a few miles away. So those are um, 
those are some activities that your eye position wants to report. And when I say eye, I do use some slang in here. And there's a um, there's a, a PDF download that um, is in this course here that you can see all the different slang terms because we're going to use them like a, a green, a red, an eye. There's just there's slang terms used in surveillance. And I've heard some really strange ones over the years. Mine are pretty standard across the board. Now, if you're a perimeter unit, you need to remain at the ready. And when I worked the Homicide Drug Task Force, um, God bless those homicide detectives because, man, they know blood sp splatter and gunshot forensics. And they knew they were just awesome homicide investigators. And they were really good guys. Like, I, I worked with them for six months and learned so much. And they're just really, really good investigators, but they're not. They, they don't have a lot of experience in the field and on the street. And so when we formed a unit, Red Rum, uh, which is murder backwards, when we formed a, a homicide drug task force to go after drug dealers that were killing people, and we were going after them for the drugs, we partnered with Homicide. And those Homicide guys, remember I talked about 1025, and while they would do worse than that, they would actually just all huddle in a parking lot somewhere and just chat. Uh, Cause that's what they're used to doing on homicide scenes, right? They go out to a homicide scene, you got your dead person and you know, you got to do your me measurements, you get your crime scene techs out there, your forensic unit. So they'll just sit around and drink coffee and chat and as a group. And so that's their mentality. And those guys have been on for 30 years, 25, 30 years. They are just awesome investigators. But when it came to surveillance, they, they, they weren't so hot. Uh, there are a couple of them that were really good, but a lot of them were just like, you know, like blood splatter, gunshot, you know, all that kind of stuff. But they would be sitting there and not in positions, like on a perimeter position for takeaways. And we were working a couple of homicide suspects that were killing on, killing a lot of people. And they had a really fast car. And <laughs> we we were set up on the house with an eye. And like, it's like our only warning that our subject was the suspect i'll call these guys suspects because they were definitely suspects and the, the and i'll tell you later on when i got burned from one of these suspects um from actually from their wife but as soon as that garage door started going up that's like i'd put it out immediately garage door going up and and the perimeter units like if they weren't set up this guy would back out of his driveway fast he had an impala ss which is basically a police car. And I don't even know if police cars are the Caprices. Um, actually, it was like a Caprice SS. I don't know. It was a really fast Caprice, like the old police cars. And as a matter of fact, I think during that time we had those police cars. He would back out and he was, he was one, uh, his house backed up to a main road. And he would pull out and hit that main road and he was on it and he was gone. And we lost him so many times right out of the right out of the shoot if you're going to lose a subject typically you lose your subject within the first 30 seconds of them leaving a location just because uh, of positioning and you're trying to anticipate and they go a different way they make a light they make a freeway it's usually 30 seconds and so if you've been out there for hours and there's your opportunity, it comes in, and in 30 seconds you lose them. It's pretty frustrating sometimes, but but that's the way it is. And so the better you're prepared, the better your perimeter units are, then um, we're good. So talking about that, if you're on a perimeter, let your team know if you vacate your position. If you're covering northbound out of an area and you're like, you know what, I don't want to bother my team. There's a jack in the box right there. I'm just going to slip in that drive through. You know where I'm going with this, right? If you've done surveillance for any time, uh, length of time, I can guarantee you as soon as you make your order and you're in line and somebody pulls in behind you, Murphy will come and knock on your window and your car will leave the location and, uh, or not, well, yeah, your car will leave the location and they'll say, oh, subject is leaving. They're out and they're away northbound and you're like stuck. And you're stuck. I mean, you're in a drive through and most drive throughs you just can't like pull over because they have curbs and stuff, right? So let your, let, let your team know, hey, um, I got northbound. 
Some of you want to cover northbound real quick. I'm going to grab a bite to eat, go to the restroom, whatever it might be. Uh, on a team, you'll have sometimes roving units. Or at least just say, hey, can somebody cover, um, like, a, the, like whoever's got south or maybe another direction. Hey, I'm going to, um, I need somebody to cover northbound real quick. Can somebody cover it for a couple minutes? At least let somebody say, uh, yeah, you know what? I'm I'm set up where I could probably go south and I can go north too. It just might be a little bit more challenging. So don't vacate a position without letting your team know or your partner. And then let's say you're you're in a perimeter position, your subject vehicle leaves wherever it might be. Wait till your subject breaks your line of sight before you move. And this is probably one of the hardest concepts to get through to people. Um, and and, and it, it sounds really silly until you you see like how our minds work our, and how our eyesight works. And uh, we're basically conditioned to pick up on movement. Even an owl who can see, you know, has the best vision at night needs movement in order to pick up a, uh, an animal, its prey. So it can see right in the dark. It can see, but it can't see anything until something moves, really. I mean, it can see it, but it doesn't know it's a, um, it's prey until it moves. So when you, let's say you're sitting in a cul-de-sac, you're on a perimeter, and your subject leaves, and, they're, and whoever's got the ice is your, the subject vehicle is away northbound. As it travels northbound, wait until it passes your cul-de-sac, or, or wherever you're sitting stationary, Wait till the subject vehicle goes by and breaks line of sight before you move. Because if you're moving, then your subject is drawn to, a, to movement. Their, their attention is drawn to movement. And that's just because they're, we have this self-preservation um, mechanism in our brain, right? That, that motion can hurt you. And so even coming up to a, a stop sign, you know, you're looking at movement. Or let's say a kid runs out in the street. Like movement is what catches your eye. And so... Um, it doesn't mean you're necessarily going to get burned every time you're moving when your subject is moving, but if there's no reason to move, don't move. Now, if you're in a position where you need to get moved to get in a better position to go, because you might get locked in, then definitely move. But if you can wait till your subject breaks line of sight, that which means you can't see them, they can't see you, then move, pull out and get on them. So I hope that makes sense. And then we talked about false starts, um, at least we're going to talk about false starts, but we talked about it on stationary surveillance. The eye has the position on your subject or your target, whatever it is, whatever it might be a residence. And let's say the subject leaves the area, the eye positions should stay there, not get actively involved in the surveillance unless they need to go until the subject has gone far enough where it's pretty apparent they're not coming back. And, and it might only be like three, four blocks. I'm not saying just sit there for five or 10 minutes till they they're gone, gone, just stay there long enough so that when your subject leaves, let's say they turn around to come back. If you're the eye, you can still get back in position and resume that when the subject comes back, you're not scrambling, trying to get back into position. Hope that makes sense. So if you're doing, Solo surveillance. Allow your subject to break line of sight before moving. So we just spent a, uh, quite a bit of time on that, right? Um, in a team aspect. So if you are, if you're doing solo surveillance, which means you're the eye and you're the takeaway. So you're usually in uh, a vehicle for an observation post. You're watching for activity. When the subject leaves, you're going to prelude or transition into a moving surveillance. So what you want to do is, again, be in a position where when that subject breaks line of sight, then you move. So let's say you're parked um, a couple blocks away. Subject comes out to leave, and then you start moving right away to get in behind them. They're going to pick up on that. If they left their neighborhood and they saw no movement, then they think, oh, nobody's following me out. I'm pretty cool. Well, you are following them out. You're just letting them break the line of sight and getting up ahead so that they're not seeing you move out of their neighborhood. So I hope that makes sense. And then again, anticipate the most likely direction to travel. And that's a, it's a, it's a guessing game and you just try to lose the logics. And I'm telling you, sometimes you think you got it figured out and 
it doesn't work out, but do the best you can on anticipating most likely direction of travel. Sometimes it's pretty easy. It's an apartment complex. It's, there's one main road and uh, you don't have to anticipate very much. It's pretty obvious. But make sure there's not a back way out into a back street or a back alley because they could get out that way, but you're just thinking, well, they're going to come out on the main road. A lot of, uh, a lot of like su suspects have expended or uh, expired tags. They have warrants. They have a suspended driver's license. So a lot of them will actually stay off freeways and highways and they'll just do main, like they use back roads. And again, that, you know, you'll learn that as you learn the behaviors of your subject. So on a team surveillance, Remember again, when your, your vehicle leaves a residence, that's the burn zone, which is, remember, they're, they're on high alert generally when they're leaving the location they know because if they're under surveillance, the most likely location is going to be where they're sleeping, where they're living. So watch that. If you have um, a team, don't caravan out of the area. Even if there's two of you, there's no reason two of you need to follow a subject out of a neighborhood unless there's just no other place where they can parallel out or they can be up ahead. So just avoid the caravanning because now you're exposing two of you uh, at the same time. And then consider paralleling when possible. Uh, I use paralleling anytime I can. So we talked about like how close do you get to your subject? Like how close is close but not get, not getting too close. It's the most risky part of a surveillance, a mobile surveillance, is learning the behaviors of your subject. So assess the subject's driving habits as early as possible. We followed an individual who his behavior was to cut every intersection, like every corner that he could. And it's the radio code or the, the, the citation code is actually using private property to avoid, to avoid a traffic control, control device. Let me say that over again. It's using private property to avoid a traffic control device. And so there's actually a citable offense because what, what people do, citizens, is they're driving, they get up to um, an intersection or a stop sign and they're like, I'm going right and there's four cars in front of me. I could just cut right through this gas station. I could cut through the shopping center. And so they'll actually just pull in and cut through. Well, if you have traffic, like traffic is, um, is designed to be controlled and routes are controlled and they're designed to reduce traffic accidents and congestion. And that's why they have a, uh, a code that you can't cut through private property. Well, he started doing it like right right off the bat from our surveillance, he started cutting through it. And we actually, in the beginning thought, Hey, he's pulling into a gas station and we'd start getting, trying to get set up at a gas station. All of a sudden, like he's gone, like he just cut through and then he did it again. And we thought, well, maybe he's just trying to get gas, but he wasn't happy where he was. And they started cutting through shopping centers and he literally every intersection that had that an option to cut through, he cut through that intersection. So um, we had to anticipate that because if he's going to start cutting through parking lots, you can't have surveillance cutting through parking lots with him. I mean, every time it's like eventually he's going to realize, boy, you know, that blue truck back there just keeps cutting through intersections with me through uh, private property. So the funny thing is, though, even if there was no traffic in front of him, he would still cut through. So he would cut through a gas station, which, which would sometimes take longer than just going up to the intersection and taking a right turn. So a lot of times we're like, hey, he's cutting through the gas station. You just go up to the, the light or the stop sign, turn right, and you're right behind him. So, but that's his behavior. And, you know, we just had to adjust our surveillance to it. So if, um, if you're following somebody, you've been following them for a while, and all of a sudden they start adjusting their mirrors. Now when they're adjusting their mirrors, whether it's side or the inside, they're looking in their mirror and they're looking to see what their view is. And so those are times that they're actually gonna see you if you're right behind them. And so let's say they are adjusting their mirrors. Well then look down, look down into your laps just so they don't see your, your profile, your face 
or whatnot. A lot of times I'll use a sun visor and I'll use that quite a bit just to give me more concealment in my vehicle. I don't leave it down the whole time because you leave your sun visor down the whole time, just the driver's side. Um, then it's going to be more obvious because people don't drive around with those down all the time unless you're going into the sun. And if you do that, drop your passenger one down too. No, not a big deal at all. If they're looking around, right? And we called it if their head's on a swivel. If they're looking around constantly and they're you know, with methamphetamine, uh, those, those folks are paranoid all the time. I worked thousands of meth sellers, addicts, um, worked hundreds of meth cooks and the meth cooks were all meth users. And so they are ultra paranoid and they're always looking around. And so even though they're looking around all the time, like, like a meth addict's brain is not like yours and mine <laughs> and, and they can't retain all that. And so even though they might look at you directly, they're not going to retain that usually because there's they're just so much stuff processing through their brain at a time. They're just to a meth addict that's paranoid, everybody's following them. Every car is following them. Helicopters are following them. They're ultra paranoid. And so don't get too concerned about that. But obviously, um, you know, don't give them an opportunity to see you all the time either. And then discreet eye movement. Like just look at people. And sometimes you might not be close enough to see, to see discreet eye movement about how they're looking. But um, if you can see it, pay attention. And if they're always wearing sunglasses and you can't see their eyes, well, then you're not going to be able to see that. But that might be a clue, too, if they're wearing sunglasses all the time. And then sometimes you'll, you know, they'll just talk under their breath. Now, like, you might not see that, but if you do happen to see like that, they're just like, you know, they're talking under their breath like that. And you know, they're, they're probably talking to the next person. That would be a clue that maybe they're, maybe they picked up on you or they're suspicious. And then obviously use cover cars. I'm going to show you that in a minute. So since I started surveillance, um, before the texting came out, I definitely noticed a shift in how people drive. And when we get to the counter surveillance section, we're going to go through different counter surveillance techniques that you should use in your own personal life. If you ever think you're followed or just vary your route, but suspects will, um, if they're doing like sometimes you think they're doing counter surveillance when in fact they're just on their phones and um like i mentioned with texting now and with suspects that are looking up addresses or doing things on their phone when you're following them usually they'll drop their speed so let's say your the behavior pattern of your suspect is normally they travel 65 and a 55 or even 70 and they're or 80 and they, like they usually go fast and then all of a sudden, they're going 75 miles an hour, and all of a sudden they start dropping to 60, 65, and you're like, oh, like you don't want to pass them, right? It's called um, varying your speed as a counter surveillance method. What I found, and then they'll, and then they'll start like weaving a little bit. What I found is that they're on their phone, and it's actually a good thing for us as as surveillance because they're distracted now. Also, if there's another person in the car, they tend to be a lot more distracted just by talking and they're doing their thing. The, the bad part about having a second person in the vehicle is if they are vigilant and they are paying attention, they're worried about being followed, is that that second person can run counter surveillance. In fact, uh, a few months ago, an investigator that I work with um, had gone to a, he was deployed to another part of the country, was doing surveillance. And he happened to run into a suspect at a Walmart, just like, like near his house, you know, the subject wasn't at home. And so he went to Walmart to get some snacks. And all of a sudden the subject was right in the Walmart. He went face to face with them. They looked at each other, which don't ever make eye contact ever, ever, ever. And we'll, we'll talk about that when we get into the foot surveillance part of it, but just don't make eye contact, avoid that at all costs. Well, he happened to make eye contact. Uh, through no fault of his own. He just happened to be in line and the guy turned around and was like right in front of him. And um, so then there's a psychological connection made. Well, then he had to follow him out because he had to follow him away. Right. I mean, he, he found his, his suspect and um, he started following him, but he, he must've drew some heat or got a little bit too close. Or for some reason that suspect recognized him and the girlfriend was with him and the girlfriend as they're 
as he was following this um, suspect couple um, on the, I don't know if they were on the freeway yet or on a road, but she actually turned around in her seat and started staring back at him. I would consider that a burn um, because that's just not normal that a suspect would do that. So um, that's the only problem when you have two suspects in a car is one can definitely do counter surveillance and do some observate observation that the driver can't do. But usually if they're pretty oblivious, it's good to have two people in a car because they just distract each other. All right, let's talk about cover cars for a few minutes here. Cover cars can be your best friend or they can be your biggest enemy depending on what you're using for cover cars. So this right here, this um, setup here, this is vehicle position and heavy traffic. Uh, whether this is a freeway, a highway, um, a roadway, it, it really doesn't matter. The whole concept behind having a cover car uh, is basically so you're avoiding having to be right behind your subject. Uh, but you got to be careful uh, because, and, and traffic is really going to dictate how many cover cars you utilize. Uh, I have no problem being right behind a subject for some periods of time, but if I have an opportunity to have a cover car, that's great. Now where cover cars can be a problem is in heavy traffic where you get stuck behind a cover car and um, your subject is getting further and further away from you or if there's a lot of traffic lights. If there's traffic lights, then I don't wanna rely on a cover car to make a yellow light and leave me hanging there. And um, so let's talk about what cover car would be good. In my experience, the worst cover cars, and no offense to the, the senior citizens out there and the elderly, but typically the worst cover car you wanna utilize is a senior citizen, just why? Well, because they're more cautious. Uh, it has nothing to do really with their driving. It's just that they're not going to necessarily take risks. They're going to obey the law, which are all good things. Um, God bless our senior citizens, right? Um, but when you're doing a, a surveillance, if um, that senior citizen stops at a light, then, and they're your cover car, your subject's going to get away from you. And so that's why I avoid using those vehicles for cover cars and there's parts of like Phoenix metropolitan area. We have sun city where I do surveillance out there. Um, I've done a lot of surveillances in sun city and you, you get frustrated out there because overall the traffic is more senior citizens. And, and so they're obeying the law like they should be doing and they're not breaking the speed limit and all that, but doing surveillance in that environment where there's no aggressive drivers then um, you kind of get trapped in there. And again, this is not a diss on our senior citizens. They're, they're driving how they're supposed to be driving. Um, as far as I know, they're our safest drivers. Uh, so what, what makes a good cover car then? In my experience, a good cover vehicle is a contractor, like a plumber, uh, a roofer, somebody in a contract truck or a pickup truck that's a contractor. Because contractors... Um, and that's like construction contractors, right? That's what I'm talking about if, you, if you're not sure. They're a little bit more aggressive as a driver and, and they have a lot of times a bigger vehicle. And so, I, and they're gonna take that yellow light rather than um, probably stop at a, at a yellow light. And so I'll use those vehicles a lot more. Plus they, they provide a little bit more coverage. So this is set up where here's your subject vehicle in red. And then we have two cover vehicles right here. And then this is like if you had a two-person surveillance, right? You're back, two vehicles, and you got somebody covering that, that turn lane. Now, what you can do is if you do have traffic lights that are challenged, like in Phoenix metropolitan area, traffic lights are definitely our biggest challenge on surveillance because it's a giant grid, a large grid and there's a lot of intersections and you don't have control over those intersections and when the lights are going to change. So what you could do is let's say you're a cover car here and you got two um, or you got two cover cars and here's a surveillance vehicle. You might um, even get up close like right in here. I wouldn't have a problem with that. This vehicle is just maintaining a safe distance. And again, your traffic conditions are always going to dictate whether you're tight on a vehicle or whether you're looser on a vehicle. And you can kind of gauge it as traffic's going along. Okay. Here's leading the subject in heavy traffic. And this we use quite a bit when we have uh, more than two investigators. 
Uh, sometimes we can do it with two. The problem is if you're leading a vehicle and you have a surveillance vehicle, like this is typically the eye, but not always. Sometimes the eye can be your lead vehicle because they can see the vehicle better. Sometimes your lead vehicle might be right in front of your subject. And so they can see better than the, uh, the vehicle that's got a couple cover cars behind it. But whoever's the eye is reporting the activity. And again, like we said before, if you have a better eye position than whoever's calling the eye, just say, hey, uh, I got a better eye up here. Do you want me to take it? And remember, you always ask. You don't just say, hey, I'm taking the eye. I got a better eye. Um, this is about asking and handing off. And there's, there, again, there's no egos in this. This is a team effort. And so um, this is a good position because if they make a light, uh, let's say these one of these cover cars stops at a light and our subject vehicle makes the light, vehicle one is at least going to be with them. You have one, at least one vehicle with them. So nothing wrong with leading the subject in heavy traffic. 